So my name's Rebecca Viney. Um, I have three jobs at the moment. I'm an appraiser. I run a coaching and mentoring um, company, and um, I run a charity called Doctors Mess, Caring for Carers. So none of that was planned. It, I actually took my pension six years ago, and I was an appraiser then, but I wasn't doing the other two add-ons. So. You guys are all, and unless maybe wave your hand around if you're not one of these, because I love those people in here too. Uh, this is Baby Boomers, which is 46 to early 60s. And of course, I only just slip into the early 1960s. Believe that and you believe anything. So um, anyone here who isn't a Baby Boomer? Yes, one, two. You're not. I am. No, you are. <laughs> That's me not being articulate. Um, anyone else? Did I miss some hands? Yes, 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 yes. Mona, put your hand down. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, the baby boomers, who are they? It didn't move for me. Oh, there we are. We are the baby boomer generation, and the rest of you will just be a small education for you in understanding why we're as we are. Um, Baby boomer, boomers is quite a, it's been thought to be quite a rude word by some of us. Uh, and certainly my children used it twice in our family WhatsApp against me yesterday. But I just have a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. um, so we're idealistic, competitive, results driven. I mean, read that, doesn't it describe you? So Noreen Batty, a dear old friend of mine, uh, who was head of GP school until a couple of months ago, um, and is a neighbor of mine. She um, and I wrote something and did a PHP a session on transforming the lives and careers of senior doctors to retain the skills and enthusiasm and passion in difficult times. And those bits I'll take ownership of, thank you, because I have got a tendency to uh, optimism. So it's really important, and we have been thinking about it for a while, all of us, because everyone was aware, and there are many reasons why people are hitting the retirement button early and the pension button, and I won't go into those. No point. God, I've got it now. So what do we want? Change of pace. We want to be able to rest a bit, uh, less long days. Guess what? COVID came along, and they thought we wouldn't cope, and it's actually been a fabulous time for us seniors. Um, so we want a new role quite often. Actually, I asked my husband earlier this morning, because he's opposite personality type to me, and he took his pension and does nothing. It's not true, but he doesn't do any work of any kind. He just looks after our many children and wider family and home, and that's something. But I asked him what it was that he retired to do because he had no upset when he did it. There was no transition. He'd been counting the weeks. He could tell you how many hours he had left. But that's a whole other story. He was a senior partner, worked full time for too many years. Um, but he said, it's so that I can do the things that I love at the pace that I love. And one of those things was reading books with school runs and everything else, you know, being there at the practice at 7.30 every morning he hadn't read a book, and he's very, very keen on that. So um, what do we want? All of those things, and some of those things we've got. So COVID wasn't all bad. Um, so for me, retirement is a flawed concept, and I stole this actually from Harvard Business Review, who I do quite like, uh, and it is true. It was um, brought in in about 1890 um, by Bismarck, who said that... Um, there were too many older people working and not enough jobs for the young. So if we pay them off, we can, um, we can get the young ones in. And they did that. And then all the other countries copied, and um, England and France and, and the rest. And uh, we haven't got rid of it. We've just moved it along a bit. But it doesn't work anymore because a 100-year life is quite a real thing. And those of us who are fortunate enough to be educated, etc., will probably, and live healthily, could well, with the right genes and luck, live to 100, if you see that's a good thing. So the point is, if you're going to live that long, let's make it the best it can be. Um, so health is important. So retirement, there's no excuse really after that for not going and taking a bit of exercise and looking after ourselves. Um, so 
this is us, and of course we're top right, we're experts. We've been striving for years, and I love the word there, that we have the vision of what is possible. That's what it says here for those of you who, who can't see it, because I'm a bit short and long-sighted. And innovation, I mean, harness us. This is wonderful, and it's great. So we saw this, if you were in the previous workshop, this is the one that's actually from um, these lovely people, um, Fisher, and, and this is for, was designed for oncology when people were given a diagnosis, shock and so on, but actually it's for us too, isn't it? But what um, she was mentioning and doesn't show on this diagram is this can go up and you experiment and then down and then up and then down. It's not quite as smooth as it looks and it's different shapes for different people. So um, I'm wondering, I'll just give you a second to think about where you are on that now. Um, this is definitely not uh, intuitive. It goes the wrong way. I hold it the other way up. That yeah. will work, <laughs> won't it? <laughs> now I'll get it wrong again. Um, just a quick four principles, which no doubt I stole from Harvard again. But I think it's really important. Prepare to go off script and, and be flexible. Your job may not end, to end when you think it might. Things can happen. Um, redundancies and all sorts. And find your metaphor. That's really important. And those of you who have retired or are thinking about it, is it liberation, which it is for my Nick? Uh, is it transformation? Um, all sorts of things. Loss of your professional identity. I think we've all got that a bit, except he hasn't. And quite a few other people. There were some at my table earlier who actually have loved not having to do anything to anyone's time. We're all different. Create a new deal. You might love your job, but just aspects you hate. So moving on. Negotiate. There was a negotiating event just now. It's actually really important for young people settling into new jobs. I used to teach negotiating skills to sessional GPs uh, at the beginning of their careers. Please come in. Oh, sorry. Um, make a difference. There are some wonderful people to photograph here. Um, make a difference. So I'm afraid we are all atavistic people who went into medicine for the reason that we wanted to make a difference, I'm sure. And making a difference... Um, shelving all of that at retirement is unnatural to us. Some of us are addicted to it, and so we do it through voluntary work, mentoring, finding other bits of medicine which work. Um, so using the skills you've already got in a just slightly different way or building on them or is, is what I would suggest. Going off and running a, a knitted wool shop is probably not going to be as easy as you think because you are actually total experts on communication skills and things like that at the moment. Don't waste it. You just fall into it naturally. You know, you're at an event and somebody starts telling you their troubles. We, we're really good at this. You know, we listen. And people say thank you. Um, so moving on from that, what does retirement mean to you? So it's just, I'm just going to flash through this because actually... Um, just read the big, bold ones on the left. It will mean, and I have thought about this recurrently, because I've been running events like this for about four or five years. And I think I've been through all of those feelings at different times as I've experimented down in the dips there. Um, and I actually, when I, I was an appraisal away day uh, about three years ago, I met lots of people I didn't know. And um, I said to this chap, oh, you've just retired. That's fascinating. Um, how is it for you? And uh, he said, oh, it's marvellous. I go and polish my cattle every night. I manage to sell the practice, get new people in. I have a marvellous time. And then he got to know me over the next 20 minutes and trust me. And he said, actually, Rebecca, I was on search for Lynn for four months. And this is this really strong sort of chap. You would just, you know, just wouldn't really join up. And he said, I was so anxious, it's unbelievable. And I said, um, snap, you know. Um, and so there we are. That was the first time in my life I'd been on antidepressants too. Um, so I tell you that because I think it's good to know. Um, it is, and there's an institute in Cloudsley uh, Street, which uh, in Islington, and I'm trying to think, I'll look it up later. 
their research, they're experts on this, and they said that this is the biggest transition in people's lives, actually, from working to not working, and it is the most uncomfortable. And that was something to do with why people only lived for three years after they stopped in the past. And there's lots of papers written about that. So I'm going to stop now and think about all of this. And before, I'm going to go backwards, actually, because... Um, I don't want to skip things, but I'm going to just think about mentoring here. It's meant to be about mentoring and volunteering, and I'm sorry I've gone off piece, but I wanted to set the scene for where we all are. So I think whether we like it or not, we all do mentor, but I think you can build on those skills. And I think also we have all been mentored. I can think of mine, um, Anne Hasty, um, Bitty Muller, I don't know if you know all these people, but they're just amazing. And they help me um, lots and lots, actually. I can't, I can't begin to tell you. And without any of them, my life would have been really diminished. Um, but it was their listening and their questioning which helped. Now, I'd like you to th help me. It, we're all different. So I'd like you to just think between yourselves, maybe in twos or threes, just think about what it is that someone did to you. What was their behavior? when they helped you move from where you were to having that light bulb moment. Somebody who influenced you, I mean, how did you get into medical school or become what you are today? There will have been one or two people who were astonishing and who you remember warmly. What was their behavior? What, what did they do? Could you, would you just have a chat with the person next to you and just tell that person about this wonderful person and what they did? And um, I'm going to look for some words when you come back. OK, can I bring you all back? Thank you. So this table, my wonderful people, um, could I ask your integer, Mona, throw me a word. Yeah, I can't get that one. What were the behaviours? What did they do? Okay. Promoted sponsored you. Actually, we talked about Anne Hasty too. Did you? Bless her. She doesn't answer me, but I still write to her. Yeah. <laughs> I think trust, because our mentors you know, trusted us to become doctors or to do. They trusted. Believed in you. Believed in us. Yeah. Sorry to put the words in, but. And promotion, you know. Promoted. When I was a schoolgirl, a consultant, Dr. Monagis said to me, you know, yes, if you want to become a doctor, it's the best job in the world. You know, I was a 14-year-old girl then in the 60s, you know. You could easily have said, oh, no, you should go off and get married or whatever. Yeah. Also threw opportunities in your way, you know, sort of suggested things to you, um, encouraged you to apply, you know. They had the vision that you didn't have for yourself. Okay. So that makes sense. Challenge okay. is one thing. That's a really important thing. You know, it's like positive psychology is the shape of a, a sailing boat. This is one of my favorites. That's positive and that's negative. If you don't have a little bit of challenge down here, it falls over. And so nine to one is the highest you should have, the tallest but um, usually three to one to make life good. And in a relationship at home, probably five to one. So go home and thank them and be very nice, yes? Um, I'm always reminding someone of that. Um, so what else? Come on. Pardon? Oh, I like that. Yeah. What did they do this table? Uh, yeah, we said um, welcoming, a challenge, um, also, yes, allowing and giving a different perspective. Just asking questions to allow the person to think differently. Um, I think one thing that you did, you did the last bit about was someone with experience. And so that was a key theme when we compared our stories into getting into medical school. Someone that's going for you and um, really can learn from and keep you inspired.
I like the someone that's gone before you. It's like someone said to me, Rebecca, you always go through the grass when no one else has been through, and it's always a bit tall and wet and a bit difficult, which means probably I'm just difficult. But um, uh, you're quite right. If someone else has done it, it doesn't feel so scary, does it? Just if they can do it, I can do it. Yeah. But also if they've done it and they're a bit like you, so yeah. if you're female, they're female. Yes. Certain yes. Certain yes. Background, so you, it's, it's someone like me can do that. And I've underlined challenge because two of you have come up with that specifically. And um, without that, it's, just, it's, it's not quite as effective, I'd say. The table over at the back there. The, the other one we had was investing. Investing. In and that was time and resources and sort of personal effort. Absolutely. I mostly do coaching, but I did get approached by a woman doctor from Nigeria on Skype about five years ago, and she said, could I coach her? And I was quite flattered, so I just thought, this sounds intriguing, and we managed. She's nearly qualified as a GP here now. Um, for personal reasons, she needed to come back to the UK, or come to the UK, and that's been quite hard work, but gosh, has it been rewarding. Mm watching somebody take off and fly. Um, so I'm not taking any credit for it. But I was just there for her, and that was more mentoring than coaching. It's a continuum, for those of you who are not sure. Um, investing in you, personal ex expense, if you like. A bit. Yes. Yeah. Well, we, uh, you know, a lot of time. A lot of time invested. Honesty, yes. Honesty and the mentor. Honesty. including about difficult stuff, being willing to admit. Yes, I had to give her some feedback, which I found very difficult and had to think about a lot. The way she, it's a different culture, and the way she approached some things could have been transcribed as being rude. And no one had told her. So only I, because I knew her really well, said, actually, can I just, I feel really, you know. and. It's made a massive difference, and which is wonderful. Um, she is a fabulous person. We're very lucky to have her in the NHS, unbelievably. Um, any other words? We've been talking about inspiration. Inspiring. But also kindness and solidarity. Kindness has really become a COVID word that we need, isn't it? Um, I must say, when I had COVID um, just four weeks ago, and forgive me if I've got brain fuzz, because I have, um, I really did need kindness, because I didn't realize, and I needed to learn how to be kind to myself. I tried to carry on working sometimes, and it didn't work. And I was sent some beautiful documents by medical friends saying, actually, look after the doctor first. Oxygen mask on you, or you can't do a thing for anyone else. And it was so true, but I needed to be told, and that was immense kindness. So, moving from there, let me get it the right way up. These, by the way, are all qualities which a good mentor will have. So you've already um, found out that they, they, even if they didn't know it, they're mentors. And they're the things that um, probably all of you have. So the GP retention scheme, and just letting you know, that was my last proper job as a primary care advisor for HEE nationally in creating the new scheme. I'm very pleased because it is better than we've ever had before. All ages, more flexi if you're in the right, if you can find the right practice, it's a good one. It might help you over the transition. Just suddenly stopping all your clinical for some people will be painful. Not everyone, but if you're one of those, it's a good way to step down. Um, now, I'd like you to do a postcard to yourself in the future. Many of you will have done this, especially those of you who are educationalists, will have done it many times, and I have. But do you know, it might be completely different to one I did last year, because I'm in that experimenting, why not, phase. And I think it's really helpful. So if you grab a piece of paper and one of the pens, I know there's no colored pens, and when I do this, normally I have at home a whole box of colored pens, which is such fun. Um, and lots of palm trees can come out of the green ones. 
Um, place yourself into the future, five years ahead. Well, um, just spend about two or three minutes on it. There's some... Have you in the mood for blue and green, John? <laughs> um, who was there? Where might you be? Anything you like. And, uh, you know, make it... You may not be able to draw or think you can't, but a stick man will be fine. Um, and who else, you know... So, and then, after, after you've been doing it for about three or four minutes, with a colleague, someone else, imagine you're already there five years from now. This is the place in your dreams you could go. And just let your dreams go wild. And it might be very different to what you would have done a year or two years ago. Um, and with that colleague, get, ask them, what did they, pretending you've got there to your picture, what was it that you had to do to get there? How, you know, it's quite a big transition from where you are now. What did you specifically have to do? Um, and the second question is, now you're there, how do you feel? So discuss it and maybe you jot down a few ideas of things that you have to do to get to that picture. When I did this for Mona's a lot at the Royal College, people came up to me five years later and said, I've still got the postcard. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the mantelpiece. We're getting there. <laughs> do you know who I mean? Yeah. <laughs> So it's more powerful than it sounds. Hang on to your piece of paper, put it on your mantelpiece, remind yourself where you're going. Um, so those, that was coaching questions, really, uh, coaching approach. It's, it turns your thinking round and makes you think afresh. Coaching and mentoring being the continuum I was explaining for. Same skills used in different ways. Um, so I'm just going to rush forward because we're short of time and I like to keep to time because uh, it's so unnatural for me. Um, use the coaching approach. So we've rushed through that. So with my, my own story is I did set up the London Deanery coaching and mentoring scheme which then moved on to become part of HEE and it ran for nine years and then it was phased out for various reasons um, or closed is the other word. And uh, now, of course, the money has been rolled out from uh, each CCG instead. But when I set it up, I was asked to set up mentoring, and it quite quickly became coaching and mentoring. And it went viral. We, had, um, we trained over 650 people, mostly doctors, but not entirely, um, over, uh, they all did three to five days training. And many of them went on to do their ILM certificate or diploma and much more and set up their own coaching companies. Some of you will know them. Um, and uh, when it closed, I started to get uh, people contact me and say, someone suggested you might be the person to roll out um, a coaching culture in our failing organization. So I won't name them, but um, it was a trust in Bedfordshire and a trust in Northeast London. And so that happened. And then it proceeded from there. Still haven't got round to doing a website and it's six years. Still haven't drawn any profit, so I'm not telling you to rush into this. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't made a loss either and I adore it. It's my passion. It was before and it is now. And um, so I'll go a little bit more into that in a second. But so, and what I noticed as an appraiser, which I did alongside that, was that half of the doctors I saw were burning out or had symptoms of it. I've always been interested. I did occupational health training as well as general practice. And I know that your work should be good for you and you should be good for your work for things to be good. Um, and so uh, ikigai is not a great word. I don't like those sorts of words, but it's a very good one. It's a Japanese one. And it just means the reason you want to leap out of bed in the morning. And I've got lots of stuff on that. And there's been deep research into it. And people who know why, and they align their life just a little. You don't have to give up your job. Just align it more towards doing the bits that you really feel passionate about. 
makes your life seven years longer and healthier. And the evidence, they've done the research, they compared this whole um, area of Japan who do that, live like that. Um, it's a long story, you need the books. Uh, with an equal group in another country who weren't taught how to find out what it was which their passion was to live towards. Um, and, uh, and they matched them for smoking and everything. And it was still healthier and happier. Um, and they don't retire there. They haven't got a word for retirement. They just move across. So when, by the time you're 90, you might just be making tea for the team. And it might be the team, might be your family. But you have a role, something you love doing. Um, and that's been useful for many of us. Um, so I run these little events. And, and Mona very kindly invited me to the Royal College Conference in 2018. And I didn't know they took that picture. People said, I keep seeing your name up on a screen, Rebecca, at the Royal College Conferences. I said, send it to me, show me. And I, anyway, I've now stolen that. And um, mm -hmm. so I then, when, when uh, COVID came up, um, I sent out a, a, a flyer to all my favorite coaches who I thought were generous and good etc and um, I, I'm sorry if I missed you out if you're in here but um, uh, and said would you volunteer I think they're going to need us big time uh, you know anywhere wherever you are in the world we can do it by zoom or skype and everyone came back including Philippa who is a deputy um, medical director for London Philippa Cockman and she um, said I'd like to work with you on whatever you're going to do on this and thank goodness she's the opposite brain to me organized and wise and uh, together we set up the doctor's mess which was a safe place for people to go and talk any doctor in the UK with a GMC number or we we blurred it or who had been and actually our best volunteers were those well retired who had been educationalists and they came forward and it, I, I just actually have a cold shiver when I think of how well they facilitated small groups. Because people were very troubled, it had to be in twos so that we could watch each other's backs and pick up when people were crying and, uh, or something. And it was just a safe place, a positive place, and we used the coaching approach and the coaching values. And everyone who came forward was either trained as a coach already which is a different mindset, which we love, all of us. It's treating people as equals, not I'm cleverer than you, even if you're young, you're equals, because you will have something else to offer. So um, that we also decided to run some training for those wonderful educationists who hadn't trained as a coach and trained them up quickly in two days um, and did it on Zoom. And then we realized that that worked, which is, we ran our usual training, but on Zoom, and we still do, because people prefer it for lots of reasons. Um, so, unfortunately, COVID wasn't, as we imagined, three to six months. It went on and then on and then, and actually different issues came up and they still needed to have a place, a safe place. And this was particularly for people who didn't have a team because they were either out of work, having to work from home because, to stay safe, or maternity leave or sick leave. Those ones in particular, or newly retired, and a lot of our um, uh, facilitators were newly retired, uh, and they were just brilliant. And diversity was our goal. And so we managed to hit all those nails on the head too, because it really mattered to us that everyone would see someone like them and feel comfortable. Um, and so we did twice a week for an hour. We thought everybody would have an hour to give themselves for some self-compassion, positivity, and sharing, opening up in a safe place with people who knew. You can't offload to your family about some of the things that were happening out there. Um, so um, money, I was paying for it at first because there wasn't much costs. Everyone was a volunteer, and gradually costs became there. So we did some fundraising online, and then it became tricky because we all felt embarrassed to ask for money for doctors. For goodness sake, there were all these refugees in real need. So, that, so we decided to become a charity or only because um, some rich lawyer in the city who is the most wonderful woman on earth, in my view, called Jill, stepped forward and said, I'd like, I think this is great. I want to give you a chunk of money, quite a big chunk. We haven't quite finished spending it. I mean, it was 10,000 pounds, but 
we're very careful with the money. And um, we had a wonderful supervisor and we needed that because we had all sorts of issues. Um, and we then moved on to getting in speakers occasionally about diverse and unusual things. Um, and, and that was a riot as well. Um, but over time, it, the numbers have dwindled. I've applied for lots of grants, haven't got them, wasted many weeks. And so we've moved on and decided that actually enough people have already set up their own groups and they've learned the rules. And if they go to our website soon, I'll be posting on it how we did it, all our rules and regulations which ensured the safety. And what I learned from running a charity, and I highly wouldn't recommend creating a charity unless it's for something really important like refugees. Um, I mean, there are millions of other things, so forgive me. But it's such hard work. The governance is so strict. The, the charity banks are so hopeless. Um, you know, it takes me hours to pay anyone. Um, and um, I'm sorry, sorry to be so negative, but I take my hat off. And Claire Gerardo and I have talked about this, and we both find it incredibly hard work keeping a charity going. Um, so all some of our facilitators are starting their own groups, including Sue here, who has been with us from the beginning, and she is setting up one for um, older doctors. Uh, um, so, um, Not allowed to call them that, but I'm trying to be politically <laughs> correct here. A very brief shout out. So, Bina, Christian Murphy, and I are going to set up a group uh, for older uh, late career and retired doctors. Right. Uh, so, that's a so you won't be able to read this from where you are. Upcoming programs where we do lots, and it's all online at the moment. Uh, we're going to, in the autumn, have occasional face-to-face -face in a wonderful venue we have used before in uh, overlooking the Tower of London, which is quite <gasps> breathtaking, which I like, because that's what this all is, the last part of our careers. <laughs> And so we've got a couple that are full coming up, which is why I'm a bit frazzled. I've got one uh, next week and one the week after. The one the week after is for primary care nurses, and it's for the lead nurses for London, one from each area. And that I got from another charity. I applied for the funds, and here we are. So um, we, we've got one called, uh, called Transitions coming up, and please do join us on that if you would like to do some wonderful high quality training which Indiger, um, Mona and Sue and probably others in the room have done. Uh, it is, I've done it and it's, it's just um, transformative really. Um, if I may be so modest, but it's not me who teaches it, but it's me who pays them. And I run it and organize it and I try and have diverse groups. So I will have several hospital doctors with primary care, unless somebody commissioned me to do just orthopedic surgeons, which has just happened. Um, uh, but they'll even, I've told them to throw in some anaesthetists and some managers, and they're going to, and nurses, because it just makes the difference. And it's like, my next one, I'm going to invite a young person, uh, a young a medical student who I met here today. Um, and we do give away free places for some, and, and, and extra bits. So it's time for me to go. Um, Learning is the only thing which the mind never exhausts, never alienates, never to be tortured by, never fear or distrust, and never dream of regretting. So just jump on the boat and learn how to coach and mentor. It's so powerful. Um, that's the next one, which has just been launched, and it's on Eventbrite, if you look up RVA. By the way, I shouldn't sell myself, but I don't want you to miss this opportunity. There are lots of people who do what I do. Ours is nice because it's a medic training alongside a totally expert training coach who's been doing it for 20 years with all sorts of organizations. But others do the same. And I would say so long as it's got ILM accredited to, then it's high quality. And I think less than three days is not, for me, you can't learn the basics. Wouldn't you say, Mona? Uh, the, less than three days. And, and we you stay part of the family. We have a community afterwards, which is useful, and we run events from time to time. Actually, you practice with every, everything. Our you family, will you do, exactly, exactly. It's it's an approach. 
You don't have to use the whole thing. And I think that's it. Oh, this, this one came into my inbox last week. So I'm going to whiz on, and um, that's me. Thank you. You're welcome.